welcome you all to the People's Law School, uh, sponsored by the Lackawanna Bar Association. My name is William Paul, I'm this year's president of the Lackawanna Bar Association. And I'm going to be introducing our speakers tonight. We're fortunate to have with us tonight uh, Sean McDonough. Sean is right to my uh, left here. Sean is uh, board certified in civil trial advocacy by the National Board of Trial Advocacy and a member of the American Board of Trial Advocates, also a member of the Lackawanna Bar Association. He's a graduate, cum laude graduate of the University of Scranton and the Dickinson School of Law. He has been a partner for many years with the law firm of Florida Lundahl Price and has concentrated his law practice in several areas, one of which is uh, personal injury litigation. Uh, Sean has unique and experience and knowledge of nursing home laws and procedures. He has testified in front of the U.S. House of Representatives at a hearing on uh, the impact of predators and long-term care on small business operations. And so I'd like to present you tonight, we with you tonight, uh, Sean McDonough to talk on knowing the rights of the elderly in long-term care settings. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm not going to stay behind the microphone, and if anybody has any difficulty hearing me, which is, I get, I get an awful lot of criticism about an awful lot of things, but being heard typically isn't fun. So I'll try to project my voice to the back of the room. I want to tell you at the outset that I took up a particular interest in these types of cases, in other words, uh, knowing the rights of the elderly in the long-term care setting. And what I try to do is, is put together a balanced presentation. We have both members of the public as well as a number uh, of members of our bar association. So this is kind of a, of a mix of trying to provide information and resources to members of the general public as well as uh, some more specific information geared to the members of our Bar Association. But I, I think that the, the nature of the information as far as it goes uh, to the members of our Bar is understandable for everybody here. Because this is the People's Law School, the focus of my um, remarks this evening will be to those people in the general public, we try to provide you uh, in the Bar Association with, with useful, practical information that you can utilize in your everyday lives. And particularly if you have uh, an issue that's confronting you at the present time, provide you with some resources and information that you can utilize without necessarily needing to get involved in the expense of engaging a lawyer. Uh, kind of as a public service amount, announcement, I think everybody knows uh, the Lackawanna Bar Association does everything within its power to provide resources to all members of our community uh, who need legal help. So if, if you're in a situation where you have a question, you can contact the Bar Association. And there's a referral service that will uh, point you in the right direction of people, uh, members of the Bar, that will be able to help you in a particular area. Let me tell you what this presentation is not about. The, the thing that most people uh, are anxious about when they think about their own future in terms of going into uh, or considering a, person, a nursing home or a personal care home, and I'll talk about the distinction between those two separate types of facilities, is how do you pay for it? How is it funded? Uh, I have some statistics uh, that demonstrate that the great majority of people in Pennsylvania don't have the resources to pay out of their own pocket for a nursing home, nor do their families. The typical nursing home, and these statistics I believe are from back in 2007, the typical skilled nursing facility, uh, the, the actual cost is approaching $8,000 a month. Most folks don't have that kind of dough, nor do their families. That's not to say that if you don't require uh, the services provided by an acute uh, care facility, a nursing home, skilled nursing facility rather, that you won't be able to get there. Uh, the Medicaid program in Pennsylvania typically will supplement whatever 
Social Security or pension benefits uh, that an individual or a family has. Uh, so that's one thing that's that's important uh, important to know. What I want to talk about this evening is not how you fund it. I think there are other programs here in the, in the People's Law School that talk about estate planning and the best way to go about trying to provide uh, the resources necessary uh, if the decision has to be made to be in a long-term care facility. The focus of my remarks this evening uh, is if you have a loved one who either is currently in a nursing home and you have some issue with regard to the care that that person is receiving, uh, there are clearly resources that you can utilize in talking to the administration and the staff at the facility that will assist you in ensuring that your loved one is properly cared for. You really need to be an advocate when you put some, when you uh, have to place a uh, family member or any loved one in a nursing home. So there are resources and we'll talk about uh, what they are. Primarily uh, governmental agencies in the state of Pennsylvania that can, that can assist you. Um, the other thing I will talk about that I will talk about is that there is a distinction between what type of facility uh, is most appropriate for your family member or loved one. You basically have two different types of facilities. You have personal care homes, uh, which the state will not participate in paying for. You can't uh, use Medicaid dollars to put somebody in a personal care home. You can't in a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility. But the issue is, and, I'll, and I want to uh, give you a, a, a website that has some wonderful information on it that you may be able to uh, watch or access when you, when you have the opportunity. The key to selecting between a skilled nursing facility as opposed to a nursing home, or a skilled nursing facility slash nursing home, as opposed to a personal care home, is the level of independence that your loved one has. In Pennsylvania, as in most states, personal care homes are far less regulated uh, under the rules of the Commonwealth of, of Pennsylvania. And as we go through this PowerPoint, you'll see that there are uh, regulations and guidelines that apply to the way these facilities are operated. And in the age of the internet, and I know most folks, regardless of age, have access to a computer. You can go to the, the library if you don't have one at home. The regulations that govern personal care homes and the statutes that govern nursing homes are all online. And you can uh, refer to those regulations and guidelines if you have a question uh, with regard to the differences in the way that skilled nursing facilities are regulated as opposed to nursing homes. I have three handouts uh, up here and I made, I didn't know, there are also copies uh, of what this PowerPoint presentation is and one of our audience members who I've known for many, many years, Mrs. Lyon, had indicated it's very difficult to read, and that's not the Bar Association's fault. So if anybody, I'll leave a few business cards up here. If anybody wants me to send them this PowerPoint, the one I have in my binder is like this, so it's, it's much, much easier to read. If anybody would like to copy of that, I'll be more than happy to, to send one to you. Um, if you, if you were just to call my office. I have three handouts out here, uh, up here, and there's about 30 of each of them for any uh, member of the, of the general public that currently has somebody in a nursing home, and maybe somebody is here because they're dissatisfied with the level of care that their loved one uh, is receiving. I do want to make a disclaimer. Uh, in my practice over the years, I have defended uh, both defendants uh, entities that have been sued, and I still do that uh, in a limited way. Uh, and I've also represented people who have had claims or uh, disagreements because of injuries with nursing homes. And the reason I say that is I'm not up here to tell you that every nursing home or personal care home is a bad place. 
there are a lot of very, very good facilities, and there are uh, many, many dedicated people uh, in Pennsylvania and throughout the United States that work very, very hard to provide quality care. With that said, uh, most of these facilities, the great majority of them, uh, are for-profit facilities. Uh, back 20 or 25 years ago, the business model for nursing homes and personal care homes was typically uh, single mom and pop operations. That's not so much the case anymore. Uh, they are typically uh, facilities that may have a local name, but generally are held by a larger holding company where the, uh, the pressure uh, to realize a profit is far greater. And sometimes, uh, when that's the case, not always, but sometimes uh, that profit motive uh, conflicts with what the objectives of these facilities should be. And, and the, the best example I can give you, uh, the Center for Medicaid Services uh, has a website where any nursing home in the United States, not personal care homes now, but nursing homes, uh, has to provide what are called cost reports online. And they can be difficult to decipher, uh, but if you spend some time, you can get into them uh, pretty easily. And these cost reports will uh, provide information as to what the average cost per resident per day is spent on, say, physical therapy, nursing services. And, and that can be difficult to decipher because the amount of nursing hours in a nursing home is a function of what, what's referred to as acuity. So it depends on the various diagnoses that the residents of the facility carry. The one thing that is easy to figure out, though, that gives you kind of a sense of this tension that exists between profit and caring for the residents is you'll find, as a general proposition, that most nursing homes spend between 460 or 470 and $5.50 a day per resident on food service. That's all they spend. Uh, and First time I found that out about 10 years ago to me was was shock, um, and that's the type of information that is available uh, to you through uh, the federal government because Medicare uh, and Medicaid collects all of this information. A lot of people tell you that there's there's a lot of waste in government. I mean, there's people all over the uh, the United States working for the state and federal government that don't do much. Don't always believe it because the reason why these statistics are collected is uh, in an effort to eliminate or at least control to the extent possible fraud that exists in the system. Because often, I shouldn't say oftentimes, there have been horror stories where uh, nursing home facilities uh, have provided said they provided or charted for providing physical therapy because Medicare will authorize it. If somebody has a, um, uh, an arm in a particular position from a stroke or a leg, so they're supposed to be doing occupational physical therapy to keep those joints mobile so the individual doesn't develop bed sores and, and has a, uh, a relatively decent quality of life. Oftentimes those services aren't being provided. And yet, the facility is charging for performing them on a daily basis. So, uh, and, and there are surveys, if complaints are made that, uh, quant that, that document, in Pen it's a Pennsylvania, and I'll, I'll uh, talk about what that website is, the Pennsylvania Department of Health maintains those records. If a complaint is made about a facility, uh, and an unannounced visit takes place, those survey results of every facility, every skilled nursing facility in Pennsylvania is on the Pennsylvania Department of Health website. Very useful information, primarily in making an informed decision about whether or not uh, you want to place one of your loved ones or even consider one of those facilities for yourself. Once again, there's a distinction. 
personal care homes uh, are not, you can make complaints about personal care homes, but they, the state of Pennsylvania does not do visits in service of personal care homes. That applies only to skilled nursing facilities. Uh, the first handout up here talks about the long-term care survey process, that information that I just related a moment ago. And it provides two phone numbers. So that if you have somebody who's currently in a nursing home in Pennsylvania and uh, you go through with the facility, say for example, what happens in a nursing home, and I apologize for jumping around a little bit, and at any time, I'll get to this eventually, any time during this hour, this is an interactive process. If anybody has a question uh, or something that pops into their head, feel free to, to, to just, to, you know, raise your hand and I'll answer the best I possibly can. But the first handout here is what they call the long-term survey process so that uh, it provides a very brief explanation of how the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, and the folks at the Department of Health actually field complaints and how they go into these facilities uh, unannounced and do perform uh, both specific investigations with respect to particular claims that a loved one hasn't been treated properly. And they also do general unannounced surveys of the facility. Uh, they have to do one, I believe, it's every 12 months. Uh, I should have checked that out before I came today. But there's going to be at least one general survey uh, per year, regardless of whether or not there's ever been a complaint against the facility. The reason why, if anybody who currently uh, has a loved one in, in a nursing home or you know somebody, other family member, friend, neighbor who does, uh, and they have concerns about what's going on, the numbers for both personal care homes and nursing homes that you would contact to register a complaint uh, is contained in this, in this handout. The second handout I'm going to show you uh, that's going to be available for you is, and that's, and it's not in this material. This is just information I came over lately. If you are interested in learning about the way personal care homes operate, and I apologize again for jumping back and forth between personal care homes and nursing homes. Uh, personal care homes as opposed to nursing homes, are facilities where uh, you have a loved one who for the most part is still independent in what is referred to in the industry as activities of daily living. Uh, they can, for the most part, dress themselves. They can walk. Uh, they can take their own medication, although they may need assistance for it. And it's appropriate for a facility, a uh, personal care home, to take somebody in who needs some minimal assistance. Uh, personal care homes in Pennsylvania are not the type of place for somebody, say, uh, with any uh, significant level of dementia because the facilities are not secure. Uh, nursing homes uh, can be locked and typically are, and they are alarmed. So folks don't have the freedom of movement uh, to leave uh, once they're in there without supervision. And that's something for which you can track as a family member when you put somebody into a nursing home. Not a personal care home. So if you put, you know, mom or dad or, or a, uh, a sibling who, who needs a level of supervision where you would not feel comfortable with them being able to, say, walk out the front door and, and go buy a newspaper, a personal care home is not the facility for you. Um, kind of the dynamic in the way that uh, a, a horror story in a personal care home, and I think highlights that point, uh, is there was a show that was on uh, Frontline, which I guess is a PBS-sponsored series that talks about uh, you know human interest stories, and, and, and they're typically hour-long public service stories that are useful to people in their everyday lives. Just two days ago, July 30th, Frontline ran a story 
uh, on a personal care home out in uh, uh, Georgia, I believe. In the name of the facility, it's a, it's a chain called Emerita Senior Living. And basically what had happened at that facility, and this uh, particular handout has that website that if you were to go to, it's a streaming video. You could buy the DVD, but you don't need to do that. You could watch it on your, on your computer. Um, the reason why that story was important was it highlighted the plight of, a, of two daughters. Their dad, I just want to tell you what his name was because he was a pretty interesting guy. His name was George McAfee. For anybody who's an older, I know we have a couple of sports fans in here. He actually was a, a, a great running back for the Chicago Bears in the 1950s. He's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And very active guy until he got to about his mid-70s. Then he, he developed some dementia. And his family uh, placed him in a personal care home, expressed their concerns about, you know, dad's uh, need for some additional supervision. But the place looked so nice uh, when they went to see it. There was a courtyard. They thought that dad was, you know, had sufficient freedom of, uh, sufficient wherewithal to get around without getting lost. The staff and the administration uh, at the facility ensured uh, the family that, that dad would be appropriately looked after. One of the things that I found in my practice in this area is that and when people call me to talk about a case, for every you know, 10 or 12 or 15 uh, cases where family members are concerned, there's maybe one that actually warrants uh, a lawsuit. I mean, it, 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 getting into litigation is, in these instances is far more the exception than the rule. Uh, the focus needs to be on, on provide, as I've said, providing people with information so that they're an advocate for their loved one. But what I found, and, and the thing that, that aggravates me with a lot of facilities is twofold. Number one, personal care homes will take people who are not appropriate residents for the facility because they want to fill the bed and they want to get them home. And they'll say, uh, look, mom's wandering, we're going to keep a special eye on her. And we're going to make sure that she doesn't want it. Well, I have had those circumstances where that just doesn't always take place. And I had a case with the, uh, a couple of years ago a lovely lady who was a good help with the exception of uh, uh, a moderate dementia. She wandered uh, out into the parking lot. Actually, a, a, a nun, uh, this was a place down in Luzerne County, a nun found her laying on the side of the road. You know, she tripped in a pothole and hit her head and had a subdural hematoma and she was dead in a couple of weeks uh, after a brain bleed. And the, the really galling thing to me about that situation was the family was very proactive and they had uh, said to the to the, uh, the administration of the facility on at least three or four occasions where they had meetings, we're not comfortable because we see mom, mom's wandering around, we'll get here and we'll think that she's in a room and we'll, we'll find somebody at the desk and say, do you know where my mother is? And they clearly didn't know. Not that you want to keep people, uh, you know, tethered to a to a chair. That's not the that's not the objective. But know where they are, and if you don't know where they are, that's not the right facility for the person to be. What happened in this particular instance with Mr. McAfee was the same thing. The family expressed their concerns. The facility said, "Hey, we we have it covered. We have people here who are here throughout the course of the evening. We'll make sure he's not." somewhere where he shouldn't be. Uh, tragically, he wound up in a uh, in storage closet and drank nearly a quart of an industrial strength cleaner. Burned out his lungs, suffered horribly for a couple of weeks, and he passed. Uh, because, number one, what the personal care home should have done was said to the, to the daughters, look, you know, you're right, we can't 
we can't keep that here, even though it's a nice place. He needs a level of supervision that we're not capable of providing. One of the reasons for that is the, the staffing levels, the regulations in Pennsylvania, staffing levels, levels for personal care homes are far more relaxed than they are for nursing homes as a function of the type of residents that they're supposed to accept. Um, so you do really, and, and that's sometimes tough for family members because typically personal care homes are more pleasant places than nursing homes. Uh, so, you know, that there's a real balance there, but if your your loved one doesn't have the, uh, the psychological wherewithal and the awareness to be in a personal care home, don't put them in. Uh, they shouldn't be there uh, because the facility is not equipped to provide that type of care. Like supposed to be one. Um, the other handout that I have is an article that was uh, from last week in the New York Times, and it th this applies to nursing homes. And the interesting thing about this article is some of the things that if you do have a family member who winds up in a nursing home, this article will demonstrate to you in very in a very vivid and realistic way why you need to be an advocate for your family member while they're in the facility. There's been uh, recent studies that have been done because these facilities can have challenges in staffing. And you know, you never want, and from the standpoint of being, being an attorney and handling some of these cases, I never try to make the staff the bad guy because these folks are doing the best they can under very challenging circumstances, particularly when people uh, are, are very ill. They're moving around as quickly as they possibly can, but sometimes they don't have enough staff to do everything that they need to do. Yay. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's probably seen it. One of the best examples of that is something that is, is as basic as oral hygiene. Uh, this is a story about what happens in nursing homes when the residents don't have any attention paid to their, to their dental health. Um, people are supposed to have their, their, their teeth brushed two times a day in a nursing home. And there is a documented correlation from the perspective of you know, medicine about uh, the development of pneumonia, for example, and poor, poor dental hygiene. The case that's documented in this particular article was uh, a woman who's trying to feed her dad in the nursing home, and for a couple of weeks, he's complaining uh, bitterly, but he's not, uh, he's not communicative anymore to tell her he had an advanced dementia or Alzheimer's, which prevented him from saying what exactly was bothering him. And his daughter said, you know, she had an electric toothbrush and she started brushing uh, his teeth herself because she saw that the tooth toothbrush literally had dust on it. So that it was, it was never being utilized. She finally insisted that the facility uh, take that out because very few of these places have, have uh, dentists that come in on staff. The, uh, the medical directors, the general practitioners that typically uh, these facilities are required to have, the, the regulations under federal and state law, they only have to see a person, I believe it's once every 45 days. Uh, and, and it's just, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a blur the way they go through. This poor fellow had had a tooth that had cracked in half, and the top uh, uh, shard of that tooth was actually lodged in the roof of his mouth. And that was a, a circumstance that when she had her dad taken out, uh, the dentist said, this is, I can just tell this has been here for a while. Uh, so you really need to be vigilant when uh, you put somebody in a nursing home. Again, uh, I, I want to make the, the, the qualifying statement that there are good facilities and good people uh, that run these places. 
The thing is, you cannot, I've gone into some facilities that uh, look great. They look beautiful. There's not a thing out of place. Uh, there's somebody at the front desk who's very uh, welcoming. Okay? But you have to get behind the scenes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about when you're kind of vetting or evaluating a place where you're thinking about uh, having a loved one live. Uh, or maybe you're considering uh, going there uh, yourself. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And don't be afraid, for example, when I talk about them spending five bucks a day on food, ask for a couple of menus. Uh, see what they're serving. You'd be amazed how many times some facilities uh, serve hot dogs per week because uh, they're cheap. And they're, and they're sorry, yes. Sorry, I have a really stupid question. No, there's no stupid questions. They ask if no you stupid questions. questions. Decipher that handout and you 
contact me. I'll, I'll give them to you in this uh, in this PowerPoint in, in, a, in a printed form. Um, some interesting statistics for those of us who are in the, the kind of the baby boom generation when you just talk about nursing homes. Currently in the United States, and I was a little surprised because this number seemed a little low. Uh, there are about 400,000 people turning 75 every year presently that based on their general health, once you make it to 75, typically you're going to live at least another 10 years for the most part. For over 50% of those folks are going to live 10 years. My generation, I'm 52, so I'm in that baby boomer generation, which is considered, I guess, born between the years of 1946 and 1964. For people in that area, uh, and, and, and the reason why I say this is that there's going to be a far greater demand, even though people's health has generally been better, there's going to be a far greater demand for these types of facilities, which requires people to be all the more vigilant about getting into one that you're satisfied with is going to provide good care. Because there's a reason why big business has gotten into the nursing home and industry, because it's very lucrative. And as we move forward, demand is going to continue to outpace supply. So the statistics are now 400,000 people every year in the United States, thereabouts, turning 75. In, in the baby boomer years, when those folks start turning, so I guess if you're 1946, I did the math on this because I'm, I'm not that bright. Anybody born in 1946, I guess, is about 67. So the beginning of those baby boomer, boomers will turn 75 in about eight or so years. The numbers then, the United States Census Bureau predicts will be, there's going to be roughly a million people a year turning 75. And that will go on for at least 18 years. So that the supply of folks who are going to need some acute care that they can't be cared for at home or take care of themselves is going to be great. And that's why we, we all need to be vigilant with regard to uh, selecting a nursing home. Yes. Yeah, I will. I will get to that. Uh, I will get to that, sir. And, and what I can do. I can't believe uh, what I talked. I talked way, way too much. Um, I can jump around here. Let, let me do, let me do a couple of things. I want to just talk generally about if you have somebody in a nursing home or you have to place somebody there, the types of problems that can occur and that you really want to guard against so that if you do access one of these surveys, uh, you would look for whether a particular facility has a high incidence of, there's, there's a couple of things that really are problematic in nursing homes. Falls, as everybody can imagine. And the, the, the incidence of serious falls in nursing homes exceeds the incidence of serious falls in the general public. At least those types of falls where folks wind up in hospitals. No, your, your intellect would just tell you, well, the reason why the more reported the greater incidence of nursing homes is because they're required to report them. You'd be surprised at how many go under the board. So you have falls. You have uh, pressure ulcers, which are a huge problem in nursing homes. Folks are not being turned. In the, in the nursing, the, the community, the healthcare community, always has an excuse as to why people develop pressure sores. Poor nutrition uh, and unwillingness to be turned. The bottom line is, when you, when you ask me, are there laws that exist? There's a specific federal guideline under the OPER statute that says if you enter a nursing home without a pressure ulcer, you shouldn't get one while you're there. Unless you have some uh, medical condition 
that makes it inevitable. For example, if you have a vascular compromise that a particular part of your body just isn't getting blood anymore, or if you have an uncontrolled diabetes or where the facility cannot be, where they can turn you 10 times an hour and it wouldn't help. But the great majority of these pressure ulcers, that they don't get any better, they only get worse, uh, is a function of a failure to turn people. Uh, those things are preventable. Uh, <coughs> Sylvia will say, I would give you anything about it. I would say, if you had a loved one who fell in a nursing home, and I typically ask administrators and, and other people, uh, I, I had a gentleman who, a, a tragic case, he had fallen eight times in the course of about 13 or 14 months. They had to put a Miami, what they referred to as a Miami collar on him because he, he, he had a fracture in his neck. It didn't render him uh, paralyzed, but he had to wear the collar to stabilize his neck. He gave him a hot dog for lunch a couple of weeks later. He had a difficulty because he had uh, advancing Parkinson's and he choked up a hot dog and aspirated. They couldn't clear his throat. He, he ultimately Died. One thing I said to the people there who were trained, you know, registered nurses when I took their testimony, administrators, you know, the fall, from their perspective, boy, what, we, could, we could prevent it from falling. We, we can't have somebody following a person around all the time. But isn't that legitimate? Legit, well, sure it is. There, there, there's a balance. You can't, you don't want people to be, as I say, in restraints where they can't move. But, Falls on older people, prevention and management. This is a great book, and you would be surprised at how few people, in, in the 10 years that I've been doing these types of cases, this is kind of the Bible with regards to facilities that really uh, are interested in preventing people from falling and striking that balance. You can't stop everyone at all, but in striking that balance between keeping people safe and permitting them enough access so that their personal dignity uh, is preserved. Title? Falls and Older People. You can get this on uh, uh, Amazon. The, the name of the author is uh, Rain, I think I pronounced it correctly, R-E-I-N, uh, and his last name is spelled uh, T-I-D, D is a dog, E-I-K, S-A-A-R. And, and I'll leave the book up here for a couple of minutes if anybody. You might want to mention that the uh, library, Black Lawn Library system has a store, a bookstore down at the mall, and you don't have to be putting your credit cards out and you use your name. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got some books there. They that's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you're concerned about your identity on the internet, that's that's good information. Um, so, falls in nursing homes, pressure in all sorts of nursing homes, dehydration. You'll see a cup of water that, that could be sitting on somebody's uh, uh, desk all day. Yeah, that's right. Day. That's right. And if, and, if, and, if a, and if a nurse's aide doesn't have the time, if they're running around and the only thing the, the only thing they have time to do is change folks who are wet or dependent because they're short staffed and there's, there's not enough people there, they're not going to make sure that they get their teeth brushed. They're not going to make sure that they have adequate hydration and that they've had enough to drink. So uh, those are the types of issues that, that you really need to be aware of. Uh, let me jump ahead here and talk about some of the laws that apply uh, that I touched on. These are just statistics to, to the extent you have any interest in any of this. Uh, as I say, if you need a better uh, copy of the PowerPoint, I'd be happy to send one out to you in mail. I, I have hard to uh, leave, leave up here. Uh, this is big business. Uh, the reason I show these statistics, and I have nothing to ask people making money, we all have to earn a living. Um, but in 2005, Pennsylvania nursing homes at $6 billion gross revenue. I don't know if there have been any statistics since then. I have not been able to find them. Um, and they, you know, they put significant dollars back into the uh, community, but there's still a, a hefty 
measure of profit there, which is not a bad thing. Uh, here's what we talk about with falls, and I would uh, uh, really commend to you reading some of these things so that you, if you have an awareness of what can happen in these facilities in a way that, uh, that you can really tell the people that if you have a loved one in a nursing home, if you're an educated consumer uh, and you let these facilities know that you're not going to stand for your loved one not being cared for properly and you know that there are resources available to you, I think you're going to get the, uh, the staff and the administration's attention better than the person who's not armed with this type of information. And here we talk about the pressure source that I had just mentioned, dehydration and falls, restraint injuries. The last thing that it, it, sepsis is a problem that is fatal uh, in most instances if it's not treated uh, very, very quickly. It's not a good way to go. Uh, and it happens oftentimes uh, from it happens from dehydration and it happens from infections that are caused once again the development of this pneumonia through simply not brushing the resident's teeth. Uh, those types of things are preventable uh, as much as the facility will tell you, hey, we're doing everything we can. Sometimes that answer is not good. This just talks about restraints. The other thing you should do, if you have a loved one in a facility and they seem like they're out of it all the time once they got there, that's not acceptable. Uh, if they have a level of awareness that you see declining at any given point in time in the facility, ask what are their current medications. Uh, ask for a consult with the medical director. Uh, the facility can't prescribe medication. Only either the primary care physician or the medical director. But these facilities typically, if they can keep people in a chair or in their bed for the great majority of the day, that's less time that they have to worry about them, you know, wandering around or being proactive on their own behalf. And I don't mean to be cynical, but the issue of chemical restraints is, is, is very, very serious. Okay, this is the Department of Health's uh, home facility locator page. And the reason why this is important is that if you're looking at a facility, obviously you want to go there uh, and you want to get taken around by the staff, but that's going to be like a, an exercise in marketing. They, they typically, you know, the more organized the facility is, they're going to have somebody there who talks a good game, shows you the facility at the time of day that they're most comfortable showing it to you. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll paint a, a very nice picture of it. This is the beginning step to looking at any facility that you think you may place somebody and going to the survey results. You don't have to have a loved one in there. There's no HIPAA issue here about uh, privacy of records because all of the, 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 the cases, the specific instances of of when they found the black is handled numerically. And then there are also those general survey results. And I'll show you what I'll show you what they look like. See, you you'll get into a facility, and this is right from the Lackawanna County nursing home. This is a case because typically when you when you and this is more from the lawyer perspective than the uh, from you looking to put a loved one, place a loved one in one of these facilities. You know, we tend to look for patterns of abuse, not just one discrete isolated incident. If somebody unfortunately fell one time in a nursing home, typically that's not, I, I don't know that it would be reasonable to hold a facility accountable for a single uh, incident. But if a family came to me and said, my dad fell in this place seven times, in the space of a year. The first thing that you would do is you would go to that particular facility and see how many other times people had fallen in the course of the year, or how many complaints had been made with regard to other residents. That means that there's a systemic problem at that facility that the administration and staff has failed to 
failed to address. So these are the types of findings that you would, now if you're looking at a particular place and it looks great, but you find that there's a resident there who has a, you know, a brown substance running down the, uh, uh, you know, the chair. Well, you're going to think twice about putting your family in there. And that's all information that's available. Um, so what do you look for in those survey results? It's, you know, every, everybody here in the room, it's common sense. Cleanliness. Understaffing, uh, incontinence care, which is very, very big. I mean, that the the incontinence care is oftentimes what leads to those horrible. Most of those pressure officers that wind up in terrible suffering for people are in the sacral area because they're not kept clean and dry, and they're not turned and repositioned. So you have that combination of. Uh, moist or soiled area, and somebody sitting on that same uh, part of their body for a period of time, you're going to wind up with a, with a pressure ulcer. So you want to make sure that the facility uh, uh, doesn't have a, a systemic issue with that taking place. And that's generally a function of course that. The one thing I want to uh, talk to folks about, I'm sorry? Go back to the Oh, yes, and that, that's important. If you put somebody in a nursing home, and I, and I should say place, I don't mean to say club, like we put our little piece of furniture. If we place a loved one in a nursing home, not that anybody's ever thinking about uh, what happens if something goes wrong, but you, okay, but you need to think about what happens if something goes wrong. The tendency in this industry, and it's a tendency throughout uh, all of the United States, and uh, I won't politicize it any more than, than I have to to make my point. Uh, big business has moved away from the right of people to be bring their case to court in front of a jury of their peers. Nursing homes were at the forefront of this trend. Would you? Bring your loved one to a nursing home, and I would say seven out of 10 cases, what they're gonna do is they're gonna give you a big stack of papers, sign here, we have it all tabbed, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here, just like when you buy auto insurance. Sometimes you'll be surprised at what your coverage actually is. Nursing homes love arbitration agreements. Arbitration agreements are typically very one-sided and they're one-sided in favor of the nursing home industry. They select the arbitration forum. They select the rules under which you're gonna be able to pursue your case, and they eliminate your right to a jury trial. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has found that they're valid contracts. The United States Supreme Court, in a number of different instances, has held that they were valid. Most recently, in a case where a number of small businesses um, attempted to sue American Express, a number of small restaurants in which American Express insisted on a certain percentage of the bill in order to participate uh, in the American Express program. I don't profess to know much about or anything about antitrust laws, but basically all of uh, those restaurants that dealt with American Express, in order to participate, had to agree that they would waive the right to a trial and they would go to arbitration. And one of the things that they could not arbitrate, it wasn't subject to arbitration, was the particular thing that they were complaining about. The United States Supreme Court, now I'm paraphrasing, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. The U.S. Supreme Court said, you know what, that's okay. And if that's okay, you're never going to be in an arbitration agreement uh, with respect to a nursing home. Very important. And these facilities currently, my experience, very, very limited experience. It's only happened in two or three instances where people contact me and said, tell them you're not going to sign. I suspect that they're still going to they're still going to accept your loved one because they want to fill with that. And typically they do. And, and then that's only happened two or three times. 
can frankly tell you, I've had 15 or 20 clients that have, that have come to me and asked me that. Um, very important point, thanks for raising. Arbitration agreements you don't want in the nursing home because I guarantee you, uh, in the event that something goes bump in the night when your loved one is there, these cases are an uphill battle anyway. They're expensive uh, uh, to litigate. Uh, there are practical considerations for not pursuing them. Uh, I've looked at so many cases where there was wrong doing to the, to the family member, but they've logged such a high amount of Medicare expenses and Medicaid bills, the government's entitled to be paid back if somebody's injured in a nursing home for Medicare. Medicaid, they're entitled to be paid back anyway. So sometimes I'll say, boy, you know what, your loved one didn't get the care they need, but at the end of the day, this isn't gonna do you any good, because I'm gonna be working for the government. Because I'll, the whole award will go to pay attorney's fees, I'll get paid, I'll hire a couple of experts, they'll get paid, the government will get a certain percentage of their, you know, they'll get 30 or 40 cents on their dollar back, but the family and the loved one, if they're still living, won't realize any financial help. Now, oftentimes, if it's a very serious situation, they're going to pursue it anyway. They'll try and make get the industry's attention about what they need to do. I, I am out of time here, but what I, the one thing I want to show you uh, is when we talk about the regulations, some nursing homes will tell when, when a family member wants to see the, their, their loved one's records, uh, whether they're still living or if they've unfortunately passed, nursing homes will still, they won't even blink, they'll say, hey, we're not giving you the records unless you have a lawyer, unless you're raising a state. Your loved one's dead, we don't have to give you the records. That's false, okay? You have the absolute right under Pennsylvania law to view your loved one's records so long as you have an appropriate power of attorney, um, in the event that your loved one is passed, the power of attorney doesn't work anymore because the power of attorney only works when the person is living. But all you have to do is be next of kin and have a death certificate. And they have to produce those records so you can find out, uh, at least satisfy yourself that appropriate care was given. This, this is a more of a narrative about the, the those over-regulations that I talked to you about earlier. Here's, a, here's the only thing you need to write down if you have a computer. 42 CFR, Code of Federal Regulation. 42 CFR, Section 483. Section 483 and the sections that follow are the federal government's rules that govern nursing homes and the way they have to take care of patients. If you have any question about a particular regulation and whether or not the nursing home is following it, go to those regulations. There are also interpretive guidelines that govern what those regulations mean. All right? Finally, if you have somebody in a nursing home, the nursing homes are required under both federal and state law to have care, plan, care plans in place that memorialize and document uh, the care to which your loved one is entitled. They also, they do document those pretty well because they need them to be paid. The question is, what they have in the care plan oftentimes doesn't jive what's actually happening at the facility on a daily basis. If you feel that your loved one isn't being taken care of consistent with the care plan, or if you feel that the care plan isn't adequate to say protect against a bed sore. You find uh, a, a red mark, keep watching. So you gotta turn my you gotta turn my mom every two hours. If it's not in the care plan, I want it there. Uh, you really have to be an advocate uh, on behalf of your loved one. I have some cards up here that I'll leave if anybody wants this uh, in a in a more kind of readable fashion. Uh, I'm happy, to, I'd be happy to mail it to you. Um, and any other questions you have, I'll hang around for a few minutes.
Thanks so much for everybody's attention. I appreciate it.